Liz will start, maybe just start from the end, so you guys have arranged yourselves. Okay. All right, it's a little hard to see under the lights, but hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a good coffee break and have been having a good morning. I am Rebecca Christie from Bloomberg News in Brussels. Glad to be here at the Tatra Summit. And this panel is on Central European investment strategies. So to talk about this with you today, we have a wonderful lineup of four folks from all over the investment community. We are missing one of our panelists. Uh, Mr. Vilagi from Slovnaf was unable to join us today. So hopefully this means we can have a more lively conversation among those of us who are remaining, and I hope you guys will have lots of questions. So please be thinking of things that you can ask and, and conversations you want to have as we move forward. Um, I think to get started, we will just have introductory remarks from each of our panelists. And once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Gordon Vina, uh, currently of uh, Meridium, doing the investment fund, will be our first speaker, I think, today. And do you know what the topic is? Why don't you jump on in? Well, thank you very much. I think we have a very broad panel here in terms of co covering all kinds of, all aspects of uh, investments from startup venture capital, uh, technology, and others. Uh, but the company that I'm representing is uh, investing into major infrastructure projects uh, in PPP. Uh, Meridium is the one, the one of the leading <laughs> global investors in greenfield in PPP projects. So that's the, the field that I'm looking at when we talk about uh, Central and Eastern Europe as well. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, the question was how, how to stimulate growth and how to, how to make investment here. The number one thing is to understand what is the bottleneck. Why is, in, uh, is it not happening at the scale where it should happen? And very often, uh, politicians, and I have been one for a while, so I know what I'm talking about, Politicians are interested to come up and say, the money is missing, we will bring you the money. And then all kinds of numbers come up in the air. 100 billion, 1 billion, 300, 700 billion. Because that's easy to explain to the public that I, as a politician, give you money for investment, for example. But if you look at the current environment, money is not the real shortage, that's not the bottleneck. We are seeing investment and well, financing at historic lows in terms of cost. Uh, there is an incredible amount of money because of quantitative easing, whatever you call it. Uh, so that's not really the issue. The, that is actually a risk. If governments start to believe that they have to take on more debt while most governments in Europe are already strongly indebted, that they have to take on more debt to do the investments themselves and therefore crowding out private investment. <coughs> That's a real risk. So where is the bottleneck if it's not money? I think it's, uh, it's projects. In terms of infrastructure, definitely, but when you talk about Jeremy or SME funding, and we'll come to that as well, very often banks are complaining that they are rushed with money and they cannot place it because they don't have good enough companies who, where they can hope the money to come back from. But that is certainly the case in terms of infrastructure. In, in infrastructure projects, what we miss is, what we are missing is good quality projects, which are well prepared, which are bankable, financeable, uh, and we, what we lack is the management capacity, often from the public side, to prepare those projects, present them, and then co-manage it with the private sector. So if you ask me what is the biggest shortage at the moment that I see is uh, the delivery of those projects where the private sector can invest and then uh, that could stimulate the economy and create jobs and growth. Okay. Um, coming right up, we have uh, our next speaker is Tobias Wenberg from um, uh, Saab in Prague. And you are going to be talking about Actually, I think I'm going to tag along to where you started because I, my background, although in industry now, my background is, is technology venture financing. And I think uh, so I will start from a much, much smaller scale and, and try to 
uh, have a bottom-up approach to what I think is important in order to build up a sustainable climate. And I still, if, even if we look at, um, at, at small businesses and what's needed to, to create a sustainable environment there, I think the problems are the same that you see on the infrastructure side, that the projects are missing or the project doesn't really match the investment strategy. And, and um, uh, I, I believe that that needs to change, of course, in order for, for all solutions that we come up with being a, not only being short-term fixes, but being a bit more long-term. And um, that is important for entrepreneurs, it's important for regulators, and for, for, for investors as well, of course. And, um, on, on another side, we have been looking into, of course, the region. We have been present in the region for, for many, many years. And this part of Europe has largely been dependent on manufacturing and has been very much of an outsourcing zone for, uh, for <coughs> European and Asian industries. And uh, that, of course, creates jobs and it creates and it drives investment, but it drives investment in a very narrow lane. And it's not necessarily good in the long-term perspective for, for the local communities and it doesn't necessarily support build up local competence and, and innovation. Uh, and of course there are different drivers between what's, what drives infrastructure investment and what drives uh, business and, and business sustainability. But in order to have a solid, long-term, stable economic growth here in the region, I think it's important that it's not only focus on, on infrastructure and, and, and what the country needs in, form in terms of the big project. You also need to have possibilities for entrepreneurs and, and owners of small businesses to grow their businesses locally and then maybe expand out, out into the world so that not all high-tech innovative industry comes from, from, from other countries, which has been the case, I think. Um, and in order to build up a stronger regional base that are not only dependent on foreign money and foreign decision making, uh, that, that's an imp important problem to solve for all parties involved, I would say. And um, I think we can see in the region a, a momentum and potential in developing technology uh, and, and, a, and an innovative environment, but and it can be competitive here, it can be competitive on, on an international scale. And, uh, that is something that needs to be leveraged upon uh, in order to in, in order to have a solid local growth, I think. And, and that's also uh, to, to prove that and to make sure that that system is in place will also uh, make investors more comfortable. Um, there are challenges to overcome, of course, and one of those um, one of those um, uh, one of the keys is to sort of create a more solid community, I think, cooperation between all the stakeholders, a strategy from, from the government, not only in Slovakia, but in the region, how they, uh, how they, force, how they foresee their, the transition from being a manufacturing economy to a knowledge-based economy, how can you support and make it more comfortable for, for people to, to give up on unemployment and, and dare to start something new uh, in an environment where unemployment is quite high already. And um, uh, and a little bit more long-term thinking because if this is run short-term and uh, with um, sort of limited uh, uh, lim a limited vision on the future, it it will it will be too risky both for entrepreneurs and for investors to uh, to actually uh, dare to do something new and to break new ground. Uh, and. Going back to that, I think it's also going back to the project side. I, I think it's important that it's not only one-way traffic. I mean, it's it's uh, we're here to talk, to have an investor's approach to it, and, and that's fine. But money goes where money where it makes sense to put money at the end of the day, and there need to be projects, there need to be businesses to invest in that makes sense that can generate return on investment because it's not nobody invests out of charity, and. Um, the tools are there from, uh, from, from the financial sector, I think, and, and, and the investors are here. It's, it's a matter of creating prerequisites for, for objects to invest in and strengthen the knowledge and strengthen the competence around that. And uh, of course, that's a challenge for the investment community as well, but, but still, it's, it's, it's also for, uh, for those, on, mainly on the project side. And, um, 
d despite sort of great potential in the region, I think it's uh, the output of, of, of development, innovation, and technology doesn't necessarily always correspond to to commercial needs. And I think we will touch upon this a little bit later on. We heard some interesting, we had an interesting discussion before that on how you how you guys are working on getting competence back into the country, and that is something I think that's very much needed. And uh, cooperation, I think, also needs to be strengthened between academia and the government and private, um, the private sector in order to create a sort of a sustainable environment, whether it is within industry, IT, or, or, or any other sector where it makes sense to, to invest. Thank you very much for that. Our next panelist. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I think, actually, the topic of that conference is extremely relevant and well-defined. Uh, my personal percep perception of the world is that the two de decisive dynamics that we can witness and see today are first, incredible amount of capital, which is really falling to the market and wants to be used, wants to be put to work on one hand, but on the other hand, that capital is extremely selective. And it's just extremely selective in two aspects. First of all, regional aspect, and second of all, segment aspect. So there are segments uh, of industries where you have, again, enormous amount of capital, like infrastructure, infrastructure in stable, developed countries, uh, where, uh, where uh, the demand side is just, is just extreme. <coughs> we have seen projects which were, which were finally priced and valuated at, a, uh, uh, at maybe doubles or even triples of the originally expected price. So we see a great interest for infrastructure in developed countries. We see great interest for innovative industries, internet, uh, 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 typically. And then we see, we see regions, countries, and segments where literally nobody wants to invest. We are seeing right now, for instance, in the energy sector, uh, assets uh, which are relatively new, uh, maybe three, four, five years old, of good quality technologically, but people are willing to pay a fraction of the construction cost for the assets, maybe one-tenth or one-fifth of, of, of the price, which means that the investors would, would put the trust into these assets have completely, uh, have made a completely wrong decision. Uh, so what, what is the takeaway of that, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the general statement? First, we need to appreciate that really in today's world, we have, or, and what we see is a, is a global competition of regions. The capital at global, uh, the companies being uh, investors and being industry players who are definitely investing actively more even than the financial investors, uh, they are behaving in a global way. They are comparing different investment opportunities. They are, com they are always evaluating whether they would develop their own production in this country, whether it would be Asia, whether it would be Turkey, whether it would be Slovakia, whether it would be Romania. And they are really internally in their companies benchmarking carefully the different cases. And also the investors uh, got substantially more global than it was before. Uh, many, many infrastructure funds or pension funds and insur insurance funds were before focused in terms of Europe, primarily on UK, later on in Germany. In today's world, they are able to invest also in different, in different countries. Uh, the, 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 the takeaway from that is that each individual state has to work and exert all the best effort to be on the blue chip side. To be very frank, this is not the case of Slovakia today. Slovakia is not on the bad side, but definitely not <coughs> on the blue chip side. Uh, Hungary, thanks to the latest development, despite the fact that I'm very far from being critical to anything I do not understand in detail, for instance, got really on the bad side right now. So in Hungary, uh, uh, typically energy infrastructure can be bought for maybe one third, one fourth of what it was, what it was worth four years ago. And the trust of, in, of investors in, in infrastructure has been, I mean, standard Western European and US in, uh, investors uh, has been ruined. And I think all the politicians in the region have to be aware of the fact that if they will once ruin the trust of the investors, the country will pay an enormous bill in the years to come. The capital will not flow into these countries. And it is not only a question of infrastructure, but it's much, much broader. Simply. We will see what we are already seeing today, countries who are attracting capital, countries who see new investments in production, <coughs> ideally new investments in, uh, uh, in know-how based, uh, uh, based projects and, uh, and economy, and these countries will be, will be rising and developing in a positive direction. 
the other ones which will not which will not be on the good side uh, will suffer and 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 we'll see a very different a very different situation so that's that's one statement the other statement uh, each state shall have ideally and I know that this is extremely difficult especially in states which are not established for centuries like the UK but each state ideally shall have a view on what sorts of industries and what segments it wants to develop uh, it should really focus on communication uh, with the investors in these domains and shall try to promote and help so that the conditions in the segments that it wants to develop are really as good as can be uh, This is true both at national level and European level, and maybe we can talk about this later. Uh, for instance, the European energy sector, typically the power generation sector, which, have, which has been for years almost the backbone of European, European industry, uh, and has created enormous amount of party jobs also in the related industries, effectively or energy demand with industries, has been ruined. This has been partially ruined by European policy and partially ruined by third national policy. The, the, the state that has really put the, the his blue chip companies practically on the knees and can be quoted here is Germany. Uh, if you look and you carefully study the numbers of German companies, um, energy companies, they are literally on the knees. And that, w but in case of Germany, it was a deliberate decision. Uh, again, the overall takeaway is that capital is selective, is selective for, for countries, is selective for segments. Each country has to take it extremely seriously and shall behave according to that. Ideally, shall have a strategy also for the segment so that it does the best for the regional reputation from the regional perspective and also knows what kind of segment, uh, uh, segments uh, it, wants to, it wants to promote uh, uh, and, and attract capital. And the differences are already major today and we will see the impacts uh, even more, uh, even more in, the, in the future. Okay. Okay, so it's quite difficult to speak about <laughs> up, up to you because uh, you just uh, took the, the very global or uh, regional approach. So I, I will try to, to, to put the Swalex perspective on the table. I mean, <coughs> two of you have mentioned that uh, there is too much money on the table. Yes, well, it depends where and in, in which sector. I represent a, a, a sector or financial sector which is called venture capital, wh which has no tradition in Slovakia for 25 years. Uh, venture capital was not present present in, in Slovakia. Since Slovakia or Bratislava is the least important, excuse me, uh, but it's not very politically correct, but it's the least important capital in the region. I mean, each of the capital uh, capitals which are uh, surrounding Slovakia are more important uh, by uh, population or economy, so Budapest, Vienna, uh, Prague, and, and Warsaw. So venture capital uh, companies have been seated there, and they were covering Slovakia like once uh, a month somebody came to, to, to Bratislava here in this hotel or in another one and asked me, so even what's new in, in technological field? And it's, a, it's not a way how you can uh, do the uh, venture capital because it's a very local business. You have to, to know what is going on, which are the laboratory, uh, who, where is the innovation, who, what are the ads which have been produced here, what are the good talents which are uh, uh, here. So that's why we have decided with my friends to, to, to create a venture capital company, a uh, private one, and to, and to reinvent or, or to invent venture capital here. <coughs> uh, so we were trying to fundraise uh, capital in our fund, and we just uh, visited all the banks here in, 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 uh, in Bratislava, which are like the daughters of the daughters, you know, so they are not, in fact, I mean, I cannot remember a bank which is like, uh, uh, deciding about their investment policy in Bratislava. So we were trying to, to uh, uh, fundraise there and, and, and uh, like the, 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 the basic, uh, the basic uh, uh, answer was that, uh, you know, it's like, it's in, in Slovakia it's called risk capital. So in fact like risk, so it means that we cannot go into risky business because we are a bank. So that's why we are trying to call it venture capital in, <laughs> in a way uh, that, that it's like less negative. Uh, so now we have a fund with 40 investors. One of them is the, the biggest one is the European Investment Fund, which have made a due diligence of ours. So it lasted like two years, more or less. But it was very good because we we prepared a big and good project, I hope. 
and uh, and uh, and with with the approval approval and the stamp of the European uh, Investment Fund, we could fundraise with other private investors, and we and we succeeded to have 39 other private investors. Like a lot, lot of them are people coming from Slovakia, which uh, have built their companies without venture capital, so they boot bootstrap. So the local uh, big companies like Asset and uh, I don't know. Ma name them all, all of the precious ones which we have in Slovakia from the technological field. Either the, the owners or, or, or the companies are uh, our, our LPs, so our investors, and they have invested for two reasons. Why? Bec once, because uh, the, f the first reason is because they thought that it's a good investment opportunity because there is a lot of talent in Slovakia, but the lack of capital in the technological field. And the second uh, thing is a little bit of a national. Uh, pride or give back to the company. So, I mean, I, I, I know that on an investment panel I should not mention that some people are deciding to invest in something which is not only motivated by a pure economical uh, 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 like reason, but on the other hand it helps because those people can help the companies uh, then to, to grow. Uh, <coughs> so now, Finally, after the second closing, we will probably have one bank on the table. So normally it happens that you have like EIF, then you have the institutional investors like banks and insurances, and then in the second closing you attract the local investment stars. In Slovakia we have made it uh, the, the other way, uh, way around. On the other hand, what was the, the problem, and, and that I'm coming to a broader uh, question, is that uh, our fund is like mainly because the European Investment Fund and some uh, European funds were involved in it, we can invest only in Slovakia. But Slovakia is a 5 million uh, uh, um, inhabitant uh, country and, and sometimes the interconnection between the, company, the companies uh, in the region are, are too big. So for example, a company is uh, uh, made uh, like uh, composed of five Slovaks but based in Br Brno in, in Czech Republic or like uh, uh, four Hungarian Slovaks which are based based in in Budapest for example and we see that 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 it's not good to create only uh, uh, Slovak venture capital fund in the future we would like to 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 more uh, uh, focus on creating a, a regional fund and I think that that like uh, the V4 should be a little bit more focused also on this aspect to, to create a structure, how to create some kind of like V4 brand and V4 uh, uh, investment investment uh, uh, playground. Let's call it like that. I have some other points. I don't know. I don't yeah. want to speak uh, too much on the, on the beginning, <laughs> so probably. It's, it's a great introduction. I'm, I'm struck mm -hmm. by the theme among the four panelists, which is that people are waiting on the sidelines, waiting for some reason to get involved. We've heard that it might be a lack of projects, it might be a concern about long-term prospects, it might be a concern that assets are not going at their full market value, that, that things are still um, going to fire sale values, or in your case, we're talking about borders here. And there's also the question of the role of banking versus more risk-taking financing. So. With those things in mind, I guess I'd like to throw it back out to the panel just to ask if there are ways around these things or if you disagree that some of these are obstacles. I mean, you are certainly saying it's projects, projects, and more projects, whereas we're hearing here that there are, there are other issues at stake that are keeping people from, from taking that first step. So would you like to respond? We'll just go back down the line. Well, it's easy to say projects, but <laughs> you have the lack of projects, but you have to see the underlying reasons. And uh, one is sort of, the capacity, the government capacity in our case, because we are working on PPP projects, so the government's capacity to prepare those projects, that's one thing. The other one is, which is maybe more common with even uh, sort of SME funding or, or venture capital, is regulatory environment, or the one that you mentioned about the energy sector. Uh, if you, it's it's, it's a no-brainer that if you want to attract capital, uh, you have to offer a stable and calculable future. And the crisis did not help that at all. Every time when there is a big crisis, uh, politics becomes inc incredibly volatile. Populism increases, isms in general, nationalism, populism, uh, and even worse isms sometimes, fascism and communism. 
uh, can raise in a big crisis like in the 1930s. Isms are not good for business uh, and not good for stable growth. Um, so populism is a big danger and political volatility is a big danger for, for uh, long-term growth in these countries and attractive uh, investment. So regulatory environment, political stability, and institutional capacity to manage uh, uh, and prepare the ground are essential for, for these projects. And where sometimes money is lacking, at least definitely in the infrastructure, is well, probably elsewhere is a little bit of money, not hundreds of millions of euros or billions of euros, but maybe the tens of millions to prepare those projects. So very often the best use of public funds is to spend on preparing those pro projects or regulations or institutional development. Uh, and actually the EU funds are there in these countries in Central and Eastern Europe, the structural funds that should enable that. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that is what I think is the underlying uh, uh, missing factor. And uh, long term, the question whether these countries can emerge to their 25-year-old dream, the sort of European standard, because in 1990, all of us believed in these countries that we will, we, it's just a matter of few years and we will emerge to what we call Western Europe at the time. Now, there was a, a great political scientist, uh, sociologist Ralph Darendorf, who once visited Budapest and said in, in an interview, to change the political system, it takes six months. To change the economic system, it takes six years. But to change society, it takes 60 years. <laughs> and now we are in year 25. And the road has not been so linear to go from a, a former communist country to be a sort of fully fledged uh, Western European country, uh, as, as we dreamed of, as my generation has dreamed of. It's, it's not linear and at all, and e each and every country in the region had their zigzags. Slovakia in the 90s, Poland had it in the, in the mid 2000s. Uh, Czech Republic had some zigs and some zags, and uh, <laughs> Hungary had a long linear period of development, and then uh, so I'm going referring back to your question. Uh, it was in a long zig, and now it's in a long zag. And, but I hope, I hope it's just a zigzag, and, uh, and uh, because the, the dream of my generation was to go and have a sort of linear and quick uh, development emergence uh, to, to the target that we have, uh, have set for ourselves. Now, why I'm saying this long sort of thought, the, the takeaway of that, the conclusion of that is the quality of governance is what will long term decide the future of these countries. It is not what, the way my thinking has changed and my generation has changed that in 1990 we all saw that it's written in the stars that we now will have to become sort of fully fledged Western European style democracies and market economies. It's not written in our stars. Some countries will make it and some countries won't. And this, what this crisis has shown that the directions can be very different. And the quality of governance and the, the way people choose that government and keep or change those governments will, will decide the fate of these countries. And it's not written in the stars. Some countries may go down long, a long way down, and some countries can emerge successfully. Uh, so governance will be the key issue here. And good governance can attract capital. Capital can make governed well can raise these countries. Daniel, you brought up national differences. Uh, what do you think might be a way around this? Do you think the EU can do more? Do you think the EU is doing too much? Do you see a, a regulatory collision there? First, I want to <coughs> make a sh short remark. If I could, I would love to sign what you have, what, what you have said in, uh, in Austria. Uh, uh, back, back to your question. Uh, EU has of course major contribu or contributed in a major way uh, uh, to call it or to more not necessarily one on one hand quality and definitely perception of Central European uh, countries as investment environments. What we have seen very clearly uh, that the appetite of foreign investors, typically as I 
use the, the, the resting capital has dramatically arisen uh, uh, after uh, after our countries have have joined the the, the EU, and of course uh, the the mandatory harmonisation of our legislation have put in place all the institutions which are effectively necessary in order to create uh, a good investment uh, environment. So the historical contribution was a major one. Um, personally, the problem which I see today is that, and hopefully it will change, uh, but at least in the last years, my feeling, and I would be keen to learn your view in this, is that European Commission has, in certain aspects, and again, it has a bit changed in the, in the last years, and I hope the new Commission will, uh, will make a follow-up to the latest trend, uh, has really a little bit missed the point. And it, and it talked for longer and longer, generally about protection, protecting environment, protecting em employees, protecting uh, all sorts of, 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 of non-economic quality of our lives, and has really forgotten about, uh, about competitiveness of European economy. And many of the measures that have, that have been taken just dramatically increase the cost of production in Europe. And we have seen already many industries moving from Europe to, uh, uh, to, to other countries, just very simply. And again, allow me to take an example from, from my own profession. Energy demanding industry uh, uh, in, in Europe, 10 million, 10 million employees. The 10 million employees are really in danger. <laughs> Effectively, for most of the producers, it is more efficient to move into different geographies. And this is a direct employment of the energy consuming industry, which has been really practically attacked by EU policies. And, 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 and therefore, I really believe that European, at the European de level, we really must have the debate of adequate weight and, 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 and actions put on uh, uh, protecting, protecting the acquis communautaire uh, uh, in all aspects and on the other hand, making sure that, that Europe uh, is still uh, a generally competitive, uh, competitive region, uh, uh, at least in the scale which is really needed in order to keep, uh, uh, keep a certain quality of, of, of life and certain strength, uh, strength uh, of, um, uh, of economies. Um, um, but again, that's the European level. Uh, uh, again, we feel at least Having the experience of the energy industry, we feel a bit frightened by certain developments over there. But on the other hand, there is so much that local governments and governments of individual countries can do that definitely European policy is not an excuse <laughs> and, 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 and is not an explanation uh, uh, for why in, uh, investments are not flowing into, uh, in, 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 into a given, uh, given country. So really, w what I could only sign here that that capital will follow the quality of project, but the project can, the massive project in the massive industry, not in internet, for instance, where you can do it from your home and you can be in Bangladesh, but, <laughs> but the, the, the massive projects which are interlinked with the quality of the local uh, uh, environment will be effectively created or killed by the quality of the government and, 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 and the behavior of, uh, of, uh, of the government. So, Dias, how do you see that shaping up, and how does the quality of the local government and the quality of the EU government <laughs> interact in, in your world? Uh, well, it's a huge question, isn't it? But uh, I, I, it, I, I, I agree. I mean, I agree with both of you in a sense. But there is only so much government can do. I mean, policy making, strategy, and uh, and the framework can be set by the government, and that's important. And it will always be important to have to have that framed in. But but on the other side, that has to be met up by a reliable uh, an environment and a competent environment to put the money in. And if, if we look at on, on the business side and not necessarily only on the infrastructure side, to build investor confidence uh, and, and to have a, a, a framework for that as well, that, that, that can be influenced by the government, but it cannot be created by the government. And uh, uh, if, if the government meddles in too much, at some point, you get you get dangerously clo close to to tampering with 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 the market and and, and the, the logic behind it, and that's that's definitely not good for, for business in the long term perspective. Um, I, I just want to tag along to, to what you said. I think it was interesting. What sprung into my head, being being from Sweden, is that uh, 25 years is nothing. Most of of the it's a lot. But, but still, in this, in this aspect, it's not that long. Yeah? 
Uh, most of the, the, the base industries in Sweden are inventions that are close to 100 years old. And, and Sweden's transition to uh, a knowledge-based economy started um, maybe 40 years ago, and we are still not there. I, I read an interesting article a few weeks ago about music export from Sweden, which is a huge thing and everybody talks about. Uh, still, annual music export from Sweden is more or less what Swedish based industry produ produces from Monday morning until the 9 o'clock coffee break. <laughs> so uh, things need to be, be put in, in, a, in a time perspective as, as well in order to, to, sort of to make sure that the region gets back on track. Ivan, you're our optimist. What do you make of all of this? <coughs> no, so I want to be a little bit... Uh, uh, I want to make a little bit uh, the opposition to the big guy here. <laughs> 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 is that is that uh, you know in in the pipeline of our venture capital fund we have uh, at least three companies which are really like at the top notch level of, of the energy innovation. Uh, those companies have a discussion with uh, Statoil, BP, Aramco, the big energy guys. But when we were knocking on the do doors of uh, Slovnaft, the guy who had to be here, or, or probably you know your energy, uh, we, we do not even know the address, whom to address. Do we do have like uh, innovation at eph.com uh, or something like that? You know, so there are many opportunities how to survive in this world without uh, without like uh, doing the the rough stuff. You know, you can do energy also in a, like intelligent way. I don't want to be the the little boy who is just advise the uh, uh, advising the, the the big bad guy. But on the other hand, uh, I think that there is something uh, true in this. So probably you could uh, look on the mm -hmm. local opportunities where I can like show you our books or our database where you can find really great innovations and which can, I mean, I mean, improve your I don't know energy transfer or transport things or energy saving by 1%, but it is going to raise the, the, the uh, prob profitability by 20%, for example. So, so that's, that's uh, one remark. The other remark I would, I would like to say is that, and it's a, it's a big, big thing, is uh, that our, com our uh, countries, I mean, we are 25 years after the revolution or the, the, the regime chain change, and uh, many people have fle fled this, uh, this country and uh, during the time or at the time when the, there, was a, there was a possibility to travel and so on. And many great people are either studying or working uh, outside of this re region. And now finally there, are, there is a possibility to, to return back and to, to build something. I was studying in France and, and uh, I am 37 years old. When, when I speak to my French uh, counterpart, what they are doing, they are assistants of assistants of assistants somewhere in the big companies. So I don't know which age are you, but probably you, are, you are have the same age I, uh, as I have, and you are the, the big guy, let's call it like that. So, so probably, probably there is a m m much bigger possibility to, to realize yourself in this country where, where there is a lack of one generation. So probably they are going to have a bigger salary, salary in London, but but they they cannot realize big dreams uh, 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 there. So in neurology and also in neurology ventures, we are not doing only the venture capital, investing in a company and then like looking on the uh, on the books. But we are trying to match the generation uh, of Slovaks or, or Czechs or Hungarians, which which are in the West have learned something and now returning back to, to this region. And this is a really big uh, 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 issue which we want to have. And and each of the company in which we invest we are trying to find a model of like east and west because those those and, and east and west skills because uh, i've been on the startup uh, uh, event the biggest one in in central europe on the pioneers festival and out of the 20 uh, the 50 uh, uh, startups which were presented there at least five were very similar to what we have in our pipeline and the technological solutions were, were much I mean, they're, they're, they're much weaker than the technological solution which we have, but the, they were much better presented and they have had a better strategy. So wh what, what is the, the issue here in this, in, this, in this region is to like structure the idea and, and, to, and to make some kind of like marketing and sales side about the uh, uh, idea. And the last thing I want to say in this block, if I may, is that, <coughs> you know, we are coming back to the education and, uh, and uh, probably is not related to, to, to our, our uh, topic, 
but I, I, I made a promise to myself that on every uh, uh, place where I, I will speak, uh, I will mention it, is that we are really forgetting any education. Of course, mm -hmm. we are not uh, having, we will not have uh, an instant uh, um, results out of investing more in the education, but in next 25 years, we, we could have. And we are lacking politicians which will find a way and which are enough young to, 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 to be sure that they will see the, result, the results afterwards uh, to invest into much more structured and much more appropriate education. Because those people which I mentioned, which are returning back from, from, from the West, are much better educated uh, uh, than those who are like only technically educated. You know, so that that's that's what I would really like to uh, uh, advise the politician to invest m much better into education, like it's now. Once again, the cross-border sure. answer, uh, Daniel, you'd like to respond. I, to I, ju I just wanted to make one yeah, very I short. Uh, I have one. Very sorry, one very short comment to what you said. Uh, when when I at least and I believe both of us talked about the role of the governments. This, this doesn't mean that the government has to be or shall be active in the business sphere, not at all. The key problem is predictability of the environment and a long-term strategy, and just two examples. For instance, in the whole infrastructure domain, the best thing what to do is not to do nothing, typically, if the ground is okay. In the UK, just to give you a flavor, in the UK, when they have took a certain decision uh, concerning power generation sector, they have published in 2000, in the year 2000, a power generation strategy for next 20 years. This is something which doesn't exist in our geography, but also not in Germany. It just doesn't exist. The rules are being changed every second, third year. In, in, in a, in a domain, here, yeah. in a domain where a li lifetime of the assets is 40 to 60 years. So you need to invest into an asset which shall last 40 to 60 years and you see the regulation changing after two years. In the gas industry, and this is a problem at European level, we have seen a new regulation coming in place in 2009 with the hope that that regulation will last at least for 10 years. Today, in 2014, we have already a major change and revolution on place. How you want to invest in infrastructure where when you don't, want have, uh, when you don't, don't have the predictability. So the question around the government is predictability on one hand, quality of communication with the investors and needs to appreciate that government needs also investors, ideally both local and foreign investors because they can play different roles. And third, ideally it should have also strategy. Like for instance, Slovakia is, or, uh, is, 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 is greatly loved and preferred by the, by, the, by, by, the by the automotive sector. Well, it needs to have an appropriate system of education and making sure that really the schools are you know, producing or preferring sufficient number of employees to be employed in these companies later on. So it is not about, I'm definitely not promoting a concept whereby government would be actively involved in many businesses, not at all. It's a question of predictability and a long-term strategy to make sure that really Slovakia and uh, all other countries can, uh, can be successful in the, in the, in the global competition for, for, for capital raising and investments. Yeah. Is Just a quick. So what's, the, what's the address where people <laughs> with uh, <laughs> innovation can write it? Uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you. But just just one thing to be uh, to make it clear. Uh, for instance, uh, we are following on on every week basis. Just just so that I give you a, a feedback how uh, you know <laughs> how the energy sector is very uh, uh, is working. Gas balance differences in the global gas transmission system, and there we are not talking about one percent. We are talking about zero point zero one percent. And it makes already a difference, and we are extremely focused on that. But uh, definitely, I will give you uh, the address, and I can even, you know, show you some, <coughs> some, some spheres where I believe a certain uh, as innovation has a certain, certain, uh, certain room. I, I just want to, to, to challenge your comment a bit. Uh, uh, I think it was good that you described it uh, as risk capital early on, because I think that is, in essence, what it is. Uh, and and your job as an investor is to reduce risk in in your investors' capital, and. Uh, it's great that you are trying to, to, to get back people that have gained experiences outside of Slovakia and get them into, into to your organization or into the system. But I think you, in, in what you're describing, I think you're idealizing a bit because I think there's one missing part here. How do you trust 
the guy with the innovation? How, uh, how, how can you make him credible? One of the reasons that, for instance, it's difficult, I would say, to get to get local the local energy sector to look at local energy innovation is when you talk to, to, to British Petroleum, they for sure have the knowledge to take care of that early on. They, they have people to, to put in that early venture from day one. And, and when if, if local private equity or local venture expect that just to be grown out from the earth, that, uh, that will not happen. The, the, that competence needs to be around the people who are starting something new. It needs to be available for them because it will they will not, university graduates will not, they will not be ready to run businesses. They need support and they need help and they need, and that help will, will give them credibility. And that credibility is what your investors need to take risk in those companies. And that's what, what the energy sector will need to, to take risk in those companies. And it, it, it will not happen by itself. Do, do we have any comments from the, the audience? If you do, please raise your hand high enough that I can see it. Um, I see one back there and one here. Uh, my name is Noam Gargar. I'm a founding partner of a technology startup, high-tech tech, high tech technology startup in the area of machine learning, statistical modeling and predictive modeling. and. Um, I have never spoke to a single potential investor who would not be interested in our idea. Uh, so just to challenge some, some things we were said here. And by coincidence, we also applied uh, our know-how in the energy sector and I've seen the disaster which, which is happening there because they need now very, very, very good predictions. Uh, the point I want to make is that uh, about the competitiv competitiveness of the European economy and uh, and uh, also about uh, well, what I want to say is that it's not not a problem to attract capital for us, but where we are feeling very unsure is how we are going to sustain the company for next one or two years with very big costs in the social insurance and. Uh, you know all the all the things, all, all the burden which government creates for the startup, and sometimes I feel that just government should get out of the way <laughs> and let us do the things because we have to do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, reporting, and uh, also what what is a problem I see is that uh, very often there are big companies applying for EU funds, and uh, they are able to attract. Uh, new students, brands which we need in the company, but because they, they get some EU funds for the, for the employment of young people, they are able to offer much better salaries than we are able to offer. And this is really damaging us because then the only thing we can, we can offer is maybe you know, more modern and more cool environment, but that's it. Great, thank you very much for that comment and, and those observations on the role of government. We have another, perhaps a question from over here. Uh, thank you, Patrick Sharp from the American Embassy. Uh, I appreciate Binai's comments on the importance of good governance because I've always heard and read that um, rule of law is a very important aspect of creating an environment that attracts investment. And if you look at the global competitiveness indexes like World Economic Forum, World Bank, Ease of Doing Business, et cetera, that's consistently been a weakness identified in the Central European and Eastern European region. So um, I was a little, uh, I'll say in front of State Secretary Hudak, I was a little disappointed that it was not mentioned in the first panel, but I'd like a reality check from the investors here. How important is transparency, uh, lack of corruption, uh, uh, an accountable and um, fair judiciary to creating an investment climate? And what kind of possibilities will our panelists here see for that improving in this region in the coming years? Thank you. Thanks for that. And we'll take a question right here in front and then we'll go back to the panel. Thanks so much. Jozef uh, Badida, energy analyst uh, from Portal Energy Prevas. Mr. Kshetinsky, uh, you are also active in energy business. You mentioned it, you just mentioned one very important thing, uh, as I understood correctly, state should not be active in economic uh, business. 
maybe you can explain more because just recently you have sold the SPP to Slovak State and Slovak State is also very interested in <laughs> the Slovak electorate and so maybe can you can you give up can you explain your words please thanks for that we'll start with that question uh, right off uh, yes clearly no that was my comment uh, to my colleagues comment that I'm not promoting a system whereby government wants to take the responsibility of the business and 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 try to really create everything in the economic domain. So that was a general comment. The fact, uh, and I can comment even specifically on SPP, but uh, 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 and the situation, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that as long as you will give me the, uh, the permission to do so. Uh, but the fact that government owns companies active in the backbone parts of the industry, typically infrastructure, is nothing wrong, uh, wrong and it does exist almost in all European countries. Effectively, the exception to that uh, is UK, where UK state is, is really not holding too many assets, uh, and to a certain extent Germany, uh, but in Germany you have the major role of the local government and local municipalities. So overall the fact that public structures are holding interest in, uh, in, uh, uh, in energy companies is something which is relatively very common and I don't feel a reason to criticize that simple fact. By the way, Czech Republic has done for sure right that it kept its, uh, its, its, its interest in, uh, in, in chess. The other thing is, of course, that the company has to be run not as a part of state structure, but has to be run in a professional, professional way. In certain cases, I can even appreciate, but I, don't, I disagree with the methods, but I can even appreciate current strategy of Hungary, where Hungary is trying to reacquire certain infrastructure, uh, infrastructure assets and very likely that investment strategy will be or could be successful in, in the future because Hungary will be able to finance itself at a lower cost than the acquisition, that the implied return used for the valuation of the acquisition. The problem in Hungary is that Hungary is doing that as a part of broader strategy where it has ruined first the trust of the investors, it has completely destabilized the regulatory system, decreased the value of the assets and then buying the assets completely depressed and under pressure. This is something which, will, which is not the right strategy. And again, personally, and unfortunately, because I'm a great fan of Hungary, I'm convinced that, that Hungary will pay uh, his, his major bill for, 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 for that behavior. Uh, uh, so so that, that, that's, my, uh, that's my answer. No criticism that state has a direct interest in certain energy companies to the extent it is consistent with this strategy and to the extent the companies are run in a, in a professional mode. So, um, just to, to get to the other questions as well, uh, Gordon, you might be in a position to maybe tackle the other two at once. We had one commenter saying that government is too involved in interfering in the role of businesses. We have another question saying, what are the responsibilities of government to provide uh, an environment that is, is conducive to economic growth? So, how do, you, how do you get through those two conundrums? Well, the whether government should play a bigger or a smaller role has been the center of debate of economists and political scientists for the last few hundred years, so I don't think we can solve it in this panel. Two minutes. <laughs> All right. uh, I can tell you my humble experience. Uh, when there is a crisis and there is a risk of the system falling, the whole system falling apart, then it, there is a natural role for governments to come and sort of stabilize the system. Once the crisis is uh, going away, then there would be a natural, well, not natural, that would be unnatural, but it would be good if governments try to withdraw. Because in sort of reasonable circumstances, uh, it's good if you allow the market forces to shape business and private sector. And governments should not compete in the private sector. Inshi uh, initiative also. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I have, in general, we have a lot of bad experience about the quality of governments trying to manage uh, private businesses or private sector or compete with the private sector, misusing their, their power and their regulatory function. But this is a philosophical debate. I think it was right in the crisis uh, for governments, even in the United States, the government, which was, people spoke about socialism and communism when the US government saved uh, some of the uh, automotive sector, uh, GM, for example, but it sold it 
few years later, with a tremendous profit, by the way. Uh, and if had they not saved that, a whole system of employment and subcontractors, probably millions of jobs would have been lost. So it's, it's right, like, if somebody has a heart attack, you need all kinds of evasive things, but you don't want the operation to continue for the rest of the life, every day. Um, so that's, that's my personal view, and uh, in, in my country I would be then now addressed as a liberal, as a wild liberal. In some countries uh, uh, I would be seen probably from the other side. Uh, certainly in Central and Eastern Europe, the, there was a huge wave of privatization in the 90s, most countries. Uh, and Hungary was the leading in that because we had the highest debt inherited. Slovakia, Czech Republic, and even Poland, because of the well-known factors, came out practically with zero or very little debt. But Hungary had a huge debt, so it had to privatize everything. It had pros and cons, because privatization brought in technology, know-how, and capital, which was missing in all of our economies. On the other hand, it, it sometimes went too far, and the government structures, and here I'm addressing the, the question from the US uh, embassy. Um, many times our governments were unable to protect the interests of the citizens of these countries either because they were corrupt or they were not up to re regulatory to deal with major multinational companies and know-how of regulations and technology. So very often we, uh, we have created uh, private monopolies. And as Margaret Thatcher said, there is only one thing worse than a public monopoly. It's a private monopoly. So that you want to avoid. <laughs> Ivan, how do you trust the government to uh, get in and get out at the right side? I, I really, uh, I, I agree that, that the government should be a good regulator. I mean, I really trust in, in the, the power of, of the government to be a, a regulator because like, I'm a political scientist by education and I think that, the, like, uh, you know, putting it that in the economical uh, uh, terms, I mean, every citizen of a state is a shareholder of the state, you know, so, so you have some kind of uh, corporate governments and, and every year you have, uh, or every four years, you can el elect the, 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 the people who are going to, to lead the ship. Uh, the problem is that, of course, we, we still have a lot of, lot of problems with, uh, li with corruption in this, in this country. I have to admit that I'm lucky I'm not very much uh, uh, touched by, the, by that, because the, count the companies with, with which I'm working, I mean, they, they are not paying taxes yet, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, uh, so I do not have to lobby to have a, a, a smaller taxes. On the other hand, on, on the other hand, uh, I mean, there is no regulation, uh, legislation in this region uh, 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 to deal with like uh, complicated venture capital uh, mechanisms. So, for example, in Slovakia, you do not have a, and, and I think it's it not in Czech Republic, um, uh, uh, legal structure which is called like a shareholder agreement. I mean, it's not mentioned yet. yet. It's, uh, you have a, an article of association, but not a shareholder agreement. So you cannot agree what are the hidden mechanisms between the shareholder, what, why, they are, uh, how they are going to, to, um, to, to proceed after the investment and so on, because it's a, it's a new mechanism. So, for example, we, as a venture capital and startup community in Slovakia, we have a quite, quite good uh, cooperation with the Ministry of Finance and then other, other ministries to, to, to like, uh, make a leg legislation which is going to help us to regulate our ourselves and so on. So that's, that's what I think is a very good and positive element. And then when our companies are going to pay taxes and need corruption, then I will uh, start to, to, <laughs> to negotiate different way. <laughs> what, what a milestone when you get big enough to apply for your own special loophole tax break. <laughs> so BS, I saw you had a comment. Yeah, well, but that was a little bit shocked to me. I mean, it, it's a... Uh, um, I will get back to the corruption question because I think it, it's, it's crucial, but uh, <laughs> uh, I really, there is no 
legal framework for, for, for regulate shareholder rights. I mean, that's no, how no, we no, do it, we it, it, it is. I, w I would mean, mention. I would shareholder <laughs> agreement as a, as a, as yeah. a shareholder agreement is, is not defined as a typical agreement okay. or standard and fair in, in, fair the, in the, in the in commercial, in the commercial code, like but in practice, of course, have been. Okay. Not in if, as uh, a so called like denominated yeah. contract. Do we have any representatives from the government here? We could have a discussion later on. No, no, it exists. It broadly exists. But touching upon, upon I think it's the question from the US Embassy, I think it's absolutely essential that uh, that, that, that the investment system is, is clean from corruption because corruption is, from an investor's point of view, one thing. It's a disruption of, of logic. And uh, it, um, it, it takes away, or it means that something, something is trying to divert or affect or in any way shape the logic, and that's, that's of course not good. Uh, it can it can probably be considered to be a short term fix and a short term interest uh, from from time to time but it's n it cannot in the long term perspective it's the system needs to be clean and decisions need to be based on logic i think it's very yeah. simple daniel yeah, i could see you've got so many thoughts yeah, and at, least <laughs> at least just one very important making follow up to us embassy uh, it is not a question of just corruption we can, can agree on a destructive impact of corruption but the headline is rule of law, which is thousand times more than an, a broadly discussed, uh, discussed uh, corruption. And there I would, I would say that clearly not only this region, but also in cases Europe would need a lesson from, uh, lesson from, from the US and potentially, and potentially uh, UK. That's a whole system of protection of individual rights of people, and by the way, also companies. And, and this is the basic prerequisite of, of, of credit stability. So definitely, this is something w which, which we need. And by the way, if I now brutally transfer something which is substantially more broader and shall be the base of, of, of our lives and, and, uh, and, and our society, this is also what the capital needs. So, so this, is, this, is, this is really extremely important. And, and I would love, by the way, also the US and also other states in the in the, EU, uh, in the EU, see screaming in each and individual cases when this is not being respected. And look at all the cases of special taxes for this here, that in individual countries. Look on the decision shut, uh, shutting down nuclear power plants without compensation in Germany. You know, if, is this protection, you know, this, I is this rule of law? There are a lot of working groups looking at all of these very <laughs> No, no, but but you can, you can you can you can sometimes screaming seems like all they're doing. In, yeah, yeah, yeah it but but e but even the scream is not too strong, <laughs> because unfortunately, and and yeah. we need to appreciate this rule of law as a basic, as a as a, as, a, as maybe more important and more traditional element of liberal democratic society than the democratic part. So rule of law as a, as a, as, a, as a basic of 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 any liberal system uh, has been somehow mixed up. With the uh, and, and it's often being mixed up with the debate of what we do tomorrow and what we what we do here and and how we pay, uh, um, uh, y you know the the, the, the yeah. specific bill and and here really we would need a lesson we would need a clear clear lesson from you, and from you and the lesson should be constantly coming over here because we just don't have this tradition, and because rule of law is a key principle has is being mixed up with things which 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 has just a fraction of the importance. Good question. Do we have more audience comments? Uh, let's see. Okay, thank you. Sorry, if you do have a question, please raise your hand high enough that I can see it. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to know uh, when the time will come when the business in Visegrad region start hiring forecasters. Forecasters? Forecasters. Any, anybody confident because enough in the panel to uh, Because this is the weakest the point future. in in Western yeah. space, when you don't have forecasters, there's no one who can spot <coughs> the seeds of new in, uh, in the region, uh, in the town, in the right. village. Uh, I'm uh, trying to forecast approximately 80% of my but of my time. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so you are the lucky guy. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying. <laughs> but there are very few lucky guys. So, uh, so I, I want to know your meaning, how to promote this profession of forecaster, not on the government level, but on the uh, enterprise level. 
in okay. our system it's called analyst. Yeah, I would and <laughs> and, 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 I would and say this is same. really <laughs> one of the one one of the key and very important profession that you you need to have not only for acquisition but also for running any uh, uh, any important or relevant business. So really I, I, I understand the criticism and I think uh, really for the states and the strategies uh, probably more focus is, is, is needed on that domain but really in the business segment uh, I, I, I'm not accepting the blame here. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I agree. Think I really think we try, all we do is we try to think how the future will look like and how we will accommodate to that. The, the tools for, for the investor and the investment manager is Excel and a crystal ball and it will always be like that I think. We, we at Meridian, we are quite unique globally because we, our funds are established for 25 years. So we are, when we invest into an asset, we stay there for 25 years and manage them. It's unique. But that means that you are trying to, to, to invent or, or forecast the future for 25 years, which is well, well beyond our horizon. Especially, we were talking about 25 years in Central Europe and how life has been changing a lot. Uh, so there is an illusion also in, in forecasting, well, because this Excel is a great invention, but uh, it, it produces any result you want. You just have to put in the right numbers. For sure. So I think what you need good quality forecasting, but uh, you can't really forecast. Well, after the crisis, and in certain countries that were mentioned here, you can't forecast one year or one week, but which is bad for business. But uh, what you also need is uh, good good quality on the ground, strong management who can adapt to new and new situations. That's how you can not only forecast but manage the future. And that uh, no right. forecaster can, can replace that. Speaking of new situations, so this is the, the third panel like this that I've moderated in the last couple weeks. I've been lucky to do two here in Bratislava. I did one in Belgium recently. There were many women in the audience. No women have asked any questions at any of my panels. So I would very much enjoy hearing from a different sort of voice. If there's any of you out there think, maybe I've got a question, I'd like to join the discussion. Um, any takers? Well, I there, think is a, there is a Slovak startup called Slido, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and normally it's used to, to ask questions from the audience because people are just, uh, they, they, they do not like to, to ask okay. personally. So they are using this system, Slovak startup. Ah, uh, I can't uh, read it from but here. Now, but now <laughs> they are just only commenting. So uh, probably, probably you should, you should, you should uh, switch the, the ca capabilities and switch, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. It, well, in the absence of questions from the audience, please raise your hand if you think of one. I'd like to ask the panel how you're getting new voices into your conversation. Several of you have mentioned the pipeline, the need for people to study abroad, the need for people to find ways to get started. How do you bring in people who haven't traditionally been the study abroad speaker uppers? How do you get them involved so you can take advantage of all of, of their skills? I just w want to uh, correct a little bit. I, I, I said that I like people who have studied abroad, uh, like uh, uh, parts of the education which we, are, uh, which we are missing here, so management, like uh, administration. So, some of, I mean, I still think that we have a very good technical uh, education here, and so, so that, that's what I wanted to correct. Uh, and. Uh, um, Answering, answering to, to, to your question, I think that uh, it's very, very important to, 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 to have a good uh, analytical thinking and, to, and, and to not to hire only uh, junior analysts, but if, if, you, if I, if I uh, 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 recall uh, my venture capital partners, they, the, the youngest person, usually a woman, is a junior analyst. And often you have to have some pap some people with experience to be an analy uh, analytical uh, 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 person. So that how do, how do you keep those people in the pipeline? How do you keep them moving forward instead of getting discouraged and dropping out? I mean, often often in our pipeline, often people are coming with uh, an idea and they think that the idea could be sold. But you have like uh, an inflation of ideas. The problem is the people who can uh, solve them, you know, and uh, and w w who can realize uh, them. So some, sometimes an, the, an idea comes and we try to tell them that please build a team, uh, make, 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 make some kind of proof that you can realize the project and then we can invest into you. Uh, so, so we are trying to encourage them to move yeah. to a next level when, when we can really speak to them as a venture capitalist. 
or for example, what, what was really good and it's happening now in Slovakia, but then also in, in Central and Eastern European uh, countries. So like people who have like earned their money, they are starting to invest as angel investors. They have a very specific skill in a, a very specific uh, 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 sector and they, and they, they help the, co the company or the team to, to, to come to a certain like Let's, let's call it venture capital yeah. level and so on. So that's very good to, 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 to address uh, the, the very specific uh, part of the investment cycle. So like the angel, venture capital, the yeah. private equity. Right, Gordon, you spoke earlier about the government maybe being able to do more to prepare people, and prepare the situation for investors to come in. Can you see a way around this, this roadblock that Ivan has just said where the junior people are told, come back when you have more experience, but they can't get the experience because their projects aren't getting through. Obviously, this nobody has found a solution. We, we have major exodus from many countries. And from Hungary, 5% of the population is estimated to be working abroad now. And this is all between sort of 18 and 40. So it's practically a full generation is, is missing. Uh, and you can't, if you can't get these people back within the, a, a few years, then uh, you have a, a disaster in terms of uh, pension system, sustainability, uh, demography, and all that stuff. Um, so it's a major issue. How can you get these people? I, th I, I support people go abroad uh, study or work a few years. That broadens their view, and uh, uh, that helps a lot would be great if, if they come back. But uh, for them to come back, they have to find uh, perspective. And, uh, the perspec and, and it happened in Poland to a large extent. I think in Poland, it had a, a major exodus of roughly three million people left the country. And then they, many of them came back, partly because they lost their job in the crisis. But they came back. And to a degree, they are changing Poland. So it can be positive if there is a reason to come back. If not, then, uh, then it's, it, it can be a disaster. Education system, I agree. That's the heart. Education is the future of every country. Uh, if you want to know what your country will look like in 25 years, look at the schools. Because those who are now 10 years old will, be, will form and shape that country in 25 years. Nothing else. So that's why the education system is key. And, it's, uh, and some countries in the region were not very successful in, in modernizing or, or updating their education system. So many 18 years old are running away from uncompetitive higher education systems in their own country to somewhere else. Uh, and the brain drain can, can have lasting negative impact. Daniel? Um, a few short comments. <coughs> For me, it's a bit difficult because we are effectively an information company. We have 2,000 employees in Germany, 1,700 in Poland, of course, many in Czech Republic, many in Slovakia. Uh, newly in, in, in the UK, it's, um, it's but but talking about the investment part of of, of, of our uh, of our structure, uh, really this this is not a sphere where I would see a problem, and kind of blue chip people we have in the geography, uh, definitely from Slovakia and the Czech Republic. Uh, I know a few guys from Hungary who are incredibly good. The blue chip people is the the people who are smart and have a lots of motivation. They are there and they are coming from the region because we are still a hungry region. We are a region where people want to reach something and, and, and do feel the motivation. <coughs> they want to, they no. So that, 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 that top level yeah. is of good quality and I, 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 I'm not worried at all. And by the way, people are coming to EPH, to the headquarters, out of the last five, three were from London, coming back from London uh, to work okay. for us. Uh, the other thing which is more important is how to, how to make sure really that the education system is working for for the mass. I mean, that, that we have really people which we need for the industries mm -hmm. which are in the companies. We need people, technically educated people, but not necessarily the best ones who would work for you, but we need also good technically educated people who would work for VET. Okay. Uh, and and that, that would be sure. more my concern, to be honest. So, motivated crowd. We have 10 minutes. Do we have more <laughs> questions and comments from, uh, from the audience? Um, were you shy today? <laughs> ah, here's <laughs> back, yeah, back to the States. So, role of 
U.S. government in promoting trade outside the EU? Thoughts? I'm happy to jump into that because uh, I think Europe is, has a serious problem of strategic growth trajectory forecasting. And uh, there are a few things that would be very logical to do that could change that negative trajectory. Uh, one is more internal market, especially services, that would add probably 2% GDP over time, uh, which would be a significant boost. And the other one is, is uh, the trade deal, partly with the US, but to a, to a lesser degree with Canada and Japan. But the US would be the most significant one. Uh, so these are logical and easy things. And the third one is uh, to have a major uh, uh, boom of investment, which everybody talks about uh, in terms of broader sense, infrastructure and education. Uh, but it's not happening. So these are the three obvious things that we should do. The money is there, the capacity is there, the, 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 will the, the political willingness should be there uh, in the US after November 4th, probably even stronger than before. We'll see. Uh, these should be low-hanging fruits for Europe, and they are not happening, and they should happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big promoter of all of, these, all of these issues. And there is one more strategic thing, if I have one more minute. Please. There were not too many questions. So. Um, over a historic period of time, again forecasting, the level of economic development in a region or in a country and its sort of political weight in the world cannot go separate ways. So if your economic weight is decreasing, your ability to influence others and, and represent your interests will also decrease because you can't maintain your military, your diplomacy, your technology, etc. So. And I think in, in the, the reshaping of our globe, uh, there are two natural al allies long term. It's, it's Europe and the United States, because long term alliances can only be based on uh, cultural similarities. If you have cultural, fundamentally different political, social, human culture, then your alliance can be interest based, but it won't be long term. So therefore, the trade deal would be one of those uh, uh, economic ties that could tie again stronger the link between sort of North America and, uh, and Europe and would make it a stronger interest representing body or alliance in a world where others will be much stronger to represent their interests. Okay, Ben, if you have. Uh, my s few short comments in here would be that first, especially for Slovakia, I think to support the exports from Slovakia and hence support the, the foreign trade, I think Slovakia is trying to do its best. And, and I, I would tend to appreciate that. Uh, because really, uh, even the top political structure of Slovak politics are supporting Slovak export. Uh, of course, are constraints. For instance, uh, uh, the export financing has unfortunately major limits in Slovakia and the budget of Exit Banka is relatively, is relatively limited. But from the perspective of willingness and, and, and genuine interest to assist, I think it's really, it's really there. So I would, I would I from, from that side, I would really tend to appreciate a lot. The other problem which we have, and we have it partly more in Slovakia than in, in the Czech Republic, and it doesn't exist almost in Poland, to my experience, is that if government is supporting any business and any export, which is effectively a great news for the country, and the country normally, including the journalists, should be cheering that, 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 we have, that, that we have achieved something or that a Slovak company has achieved something on foreign markets. Here and there, you always you know, hear noises, who and who, what for, and wh what was behind, and who is the owner, and who had met, and, and, and you know, uh, that the owner met last week somebody in a cafe. And you have all, you have, you have all that omnipresent suspicion what, what, is, what is behind, which is, which, is quite, which is, I think, quite frustrating. It doesn't concern me necessarily. The, the and, problem and is that this is really, this is, this, 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 this is frustrating. So I would appreciate the activity of the government, but unfortunately, that omnipresent suspicion concerns also these, these situations, and, and that, that is frustrating. Yeah. Ivan, the problem is that the cafe, <laughs> the cafe should be open to everybody. You know? It <laughs> should not be the, <laughs> the, the part of the cafe. I, I have only a very limited yeah. experience with, with, with the system here, but to be... I, I don't have a single doubt mm -hmm. 
that any company that wants to export as a Slovak company abroad will get a support of, of Slovak government. Seriously, I mean relevant company. Of course, if you have five people, it's difficult. But if you have somewhere, you know, a few hundreds or thousand employees, I'm sure you will you will you, you will get the support. But again, and that's one of the biggest or one of the great problems of our society is because our society is asked more because our system are clientelistic. By the way, the French one is as well. So we don't have to. Okay. Well, uh, but a, but <laughs> but a free press that shines but lights but in yeah. dark corners is always a thing to be uh, proud of as an institution. To be. Uh, <laughs> but the I think the, the, the governmental interference here, I mean, w w one thing is just support export, but uh, supporting export, I mean, the, the, the main sure. export from Slovakia today, I guess, are not Slovakian companies. The long-term strategy for Slovakia could be that in, in, I don't know, another 25 years, maybe uh, have at least balanced out the, the Volkswagen and the Kias and the Samsungs with three or four large Slovakian companies who provide, who, who let the value stay in the country and not only passing, that not only being money passing I'm through. I'm 100% supporting, but this is not the perception in Slovakia today. Oh no, if government would be supporting Volkswagen, media would just, you know, uh, applaud. If you, if you support the private individual who, who, who built his own business, you will feel the suspicion. And when I use the term clientelistic business, sorry, just a short explanation. We are a small country well, where everybody knows everyone. I, that I have was to what say, uh, after 20 years in journalism, I think yeah. suspicion comes with the territory because it is our job to ask questions as we ask no questions. No, no, no. It is not. It is not. It is not. A, it, it, you know, be we have invested in media, and, and and I think the role of media is extremely, extremely important. But the problem is not a relevant focus and our relevant comments uh, to a specific case. This is the overall omnipresent feeling that everything, everything is suspicious. And every, every time when somebody from the country gets some support, it could be you. Uh, and you know, you know that you behave, I guess, in an honest way. But anyway, I can tell you that if you get a subsidy from a state fund, you would see on the internet many comments, how it is possible, who do you know, who is your classmate. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is something which is, and I have to say, in that specific domain, really uh, highly unfortunate uh, and, and, and frustrating. So yeah, that I, I agree, and I think that's one of the key issues to solve, to, to, to add, to, to remove that sense of suspicion and add credibility to the system instead. Absolutely. So probably the solution is to act always in a full transparency, then I do not care about uh, if somebody writes uh, on the internet because then it's like... Uh, but the politicians will. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they will support you with a good intention and then they will get all the blame. Yes, mm -hmm. I, that, that, that's I possible. I think it was the Peter Esterhaz who wrote once that there's a special kind of Central European uh, paranoia, yeah. which sounds like, I feel somebody's following me, and it's true. Ivan, <laughs> 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 we have uh, two minutes left. Would yeah, you like to offer like a, a couple of uh, I mean, we, we are go going to the discussion of small and, and big uh, companies, and I think that there should be some kind of me mechanism because in, in my work I see like uh, companies with two or three million uh, of turnover which can become like 40 or 50 million uh, of turnover in like three or four years. But they are in some kind of uh, value of that because uh, banks are not helping them. They are not in the spotlight of the politician because they cannot make a picture in front of a big factory but of a small factory and like with five people. So probably there should be, should be mechanism of a whole eco ecosystem, banks, media, big guys, small guys, to, to, to help those future leaders. Uh, when in 25 years we are going to discuss about the companies which we are trying trying to take care of <laughs> right uh, right now because I mean uh, th there will be nothing more to privatize. There like all the, the big things have are going to be solved. So we have to reinvent which are going to be the big companies in the next 25 years. If you if you check the list of the uh, Fortune 500 uh, uh, companies, I mean, I think that half of them have not been there uh, 20 years ago. So, so th that's why we have to really, uh, uh, I mean, check what are they going to be the next big guys. And, uh, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Thanks so much. With that optimistic comment, thank you so much for coming to our panel. You've been a very attentive audience. Uh, I think there are sessions this afternoon, different things depending on, on what, uh, what interests you. And thank you for your time. Thank you to our great panelists for the wonderful discussion. Thank you.